Welcome to the Washington Post Live discussion on America's health future. I'm Christopher Callahan of M&T Bank's Healthcare Banking Group. M&T is delighted to sponsor today's event, and we thank you for joining us. M&T Bank has a long commitment to the healthcare sector, partnering with our communities and clients to help keep people healthy, provide diverse housing options for seniors, and bring healthcare to the sick and vulnerable. These are unprecedented times. Now more than ever, M&T Bank is embracing our community roots and building on long journey relationships to support our clients, communities, and employees. It is only through these relationships that we can learn, share ideas, and develop creative solutions to meet our shared goals. We'll get through these challenges together. On behalf of M&T Bank, I thank you again for joining us today. Good afternoon. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, a health policy reporter here at the Washington Post and author of the Health 202 newsletter. And this afternoon, I'm delighted to welcome our first guest, Dr. Eric Topol, who's founder and director of the Scripps Research Translational Re Institute and the executive vice president of Scripps Research. Welcome to po Washington Post Live, Dr. Topol. Thanks, Paige. It's great to be with you. I want to start off, of course, by talking about the search for a vaccine, which is something I know a lot of our, our viewers are paying attention to. Um, we saw this controversy over these stricter standards that the FDA was considering for granting emergency use authorization. And last week, the White House signed off on those standards after the president had indicated he thought they were politically motivated. Um, can you give us your response to that? Does that satisfy any concerns you may have had about this process being rushed? Right. Well, the concerns were that there was tremendous pressure being exerted from the White House to get the vaccines, a vaccine emergency authorized by FDA before the election. And now I think thankfully, uh, through a lot of efforts, we've been able to uh, shirk that, to preempt that. There will be vaccines approved in the months ahead. Perhaps uh, this is not a formal approval, but a emergency authorization, an EUA. And we'll likely see that towards the end of November or December, at least the first vaccine. But at least we're, we're taking the politics aside and it will be done properly through both FDA internal review and the external review. So uh, we've got that on track now and I feel much better that uh, Dr. Hahn and the FDA uh, people have stood up to the uh, to the pressure that was just uh, absurd. Well, and, and do you see this move as more important in terms of increasing the public's confidence in a vaccine, uh, which it would, I guess is more of a messaging um, public perception type of question, or more important for ensuring that we know that the vaccine works and is safe before emergency use uh, is authorized? Right. Well, these are not only the, some of the largest trials, clinical trials ever conducted, but also the fastest. And what we don't need at this point is any shortcut, because once a vaccine gets out there, if we see safety issues that uh, crop up uh, that were not uh, previously um, manifest, that could put the entire landscape of vaccines in jeopardy. As you well know, Paige, just so much is dependent on the public trust. And so we don't want any shortcuts. We don't need rush job. It's been moving at a velocity that's just unprecedented. But let's just, as we get to the last mile of a vaccine approval, let's make sure we have as much data about safety 
which is part of that Titan guidelines by FDA, and also about efficacy. And that was about inclusion of some serious events, not just mild infections as the endpoint of the trial. So we're making progress. Uh, I, I'm confident now the review will be done properly. And this is a, the sort of thing we desperately need to foster the trust of, of all Americans and around the world. You interviewed FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn last week, um, and I know that you have previously been critical um, of some of the, the health, how the health agencies have responded to certain things. I know there were some controversies about uh, some things that he had said about blood plasma a couple of months ago. Um, I know that he assured you that decisions will be made on science alone. Has your view of the FDA changed at all over the last couple of months? Uh, and can you kind of walk us through that? Right. Well, um, I was at the peak of mistrust when I wrote this open letter uh, to Commissioner Hahn because there had been an EUA that was unfounded on hydroxychloroquine back in March that subsequently had to be withdrawn uh, in June because it didn't work and there were significant uh, side effects. Then there was the EUA, as you'll recall, on convalescent plasma, which was such a mistake because not only was the evidence lacking, but the grandstanding, that is this very historic breakthrough press conference, just happened to be the night before the Republican convention. Um, this is really extraordinary and unprecedented. So I had lost trust in the FDA, but fortunately uh, through multiple conversations and also seeing the action of um, Commissioner Hahn with his team at FDA, including Peter Marks and many other people, uh, we saw a whole different tact. And this was standing up to political pressure. And to me, that's the first independent sign. It's really great to see, and we desperately needed it. And that was a pretty extensive interview with Han um, and really fascinating. What in particular did he say that helped to, to strengthen your confidence now that the agency isn't giving into any potential political interference? Well, I think what was clear is, you know, he, he put his job on the line. He was willing to be fired. Uh, and, uh, you know, I referred to that and, you know, he can only say so much because he still doesn't want to get fired for trying to stay on the course of getting the vaccines through due process. But um, to see that, you know, we haven't seen that at CDC. Uh, and we had had a lapse of some of our most important uh, public health scientists uh, who would, you know, stand up to pressure. And we just can't get the bullying, uh, you know, allow that to occur because too much is on the line. I mean, the vaccine, it, it, and as I know, we'll talk about also the monoclonal antibodies. These are pivotal parts of our exit strategy to return to pre-pandemic, pre-COVID life. And we just don't want to put anything at risk. We've heard uh, Dr. Fauci and CDC Director Robert Redfield say that a vaccine will be widely available to the public uh, by late spring or early summer. Do you view that as a realistic timeline, assuming that we do have some type of EUA by the end of the year? Yes, I think, you know, the, the 2021 is going to be the year of the vaccine rollout. There'll be multiple vaccines ultimately. And it's just a matter of getting it to as many people who are willing to take the vaccines as possible. And remember, these are the first generation vaccines. Likely over time, there'll be even more potent ones. So, uh, and, and you could take one of the, the, the uh, second generation, if you will, after even having gotten one of the first. So I think we'll see great progress over the year, whether it's you know by the summer or the fall next year, but we should be able to get this notable goal of population immunity, uh, the vast majority of people uh, to get vaccines. And we also need to have the support, the education about how vaccination is really important so that everyone is willing to, to get this. And even if we don't get to 100%, as long as we get uh, a significant majority. We saw the news yesterday that uh, Johnson & Johnson announced it had paused its late stage trial uh, after a participant had reported some illness. Uh, does that give, give you cause for concern? Do we know how serious that is? I know sometimes these things happen during clinical trials. Uh, what's your take on that? 
Well, it's good that uh, a trial was stopped because of a safety concern. That's the normal action. Uh, we don't know enough about the details. I mean, we've seen uh, a case of this so-called transverse myelitis from the AstraZeneca vaccine that um, is still on hold in the U.S. after now a few weeks. If it turns out that this was a case of transverse myelitis, that would be concerning. But we don't know any of the details. My guess is that it will probably be adjudicated not to be vaccine related or not to be serious. Uh, and it will be the, the, the vaccine trials will go straight away uh, in a short time. So until we know more, it's, it's not hard to know uh, where this is headed. But most likely, uh, it's, it's just a matter of days. And uh, also, it's, it's good that we're seeing the independent data and safety monitoring board making the call as to a suitability for the trial to continue. Well, and as you note, we have a number of vaccine candidates now in late stage trials. Do you see one in particular as the most promising? Well, what's great is the diversity. You know, we've got mRNA vaccines, which have never been at scale. Uh, and they code for uh, the spike protein to develop immune response. We've got uh, genetic vaccines uh, and we've got the adenoviral vector vaccines. I mean, it's just great. We have lots of different shots on goal. It's really hard to know whether one will have an advantage of an, uh, over another. There's also logistical issues, Paige, like, for example, one shot uh, versus two shots initially. Uh, Johnson Johnson ha is a, a single uh, shot vaccine. There's also issues about refrigeration. I mean, there's so many different logistical things too. Um, so I think it just takes time to play out. We welcome and need all of them because when you're trying to get vaccination to hundreds of millions of people, you can't do it with one vaccine. So we hope all will be successful. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, it, it's actually exciting the prospects for safe and effective vaccines uh, in the in the weeks ahead, I mean months at most, is really um, a, a great thing that would be unanticipated uh, just years ago that this would be possible. Well, and we know we have several vaccine candidates being worked on by U.S. companies and also several candidates being worked on by pharmaceutical companies in China. What difference do you think it makes in terms of, or, or if any difference in terms of Americans accessing a vaccine if it is a U.S. company that arrives at a vaccine versus a Chinese company first? Right. Well, you know, I think it's all depends on the data. Um, you know, these are large trials that we're looking at, ranging from 30 to 60,000 uh, uh, participants. And so, you know, what we, we want to see is the data. And, and it's not just about uh, ideally uh, the safety, uh, how long the vaccines last. You know, a really important consideration page is we don't know whether the vaccines will be good for six months, a year, or multiple years. So durability of vaccine protection is also important. So it's just really data dependent. I don't think that we want to uh, say if it's if it's made in this country, it's good or bad. It's really the data set uh, and um, the follow up and uh, you know the how how well it, it it succeeds in in the real world. Uh, you know I think what we're interested in is, is that immune response, not just the antibodies, but also the T cell response because that's kind of a bonus factor. And some of the vaccines seem to have a better T cell, the so-called CD8 cytotoxic T cell response than others. And that'll be really interesting to see if that plays out to be important. Well, and then as you mentioned, the, the, the question of access um, and the challenge of distributing, you know, a vaccine to to to, to millions of Americans. Um, and, you know, there seems to be a discussion among health experts also about how much hope to place in a vaccine, right? I mean, on one hand, um, we're told that, you know, we, should, we shouldn't put, place all our hope on this because it's still going to be many months before this can be rolled out. On the other hand, um, you know, speaking as a mom, it's hard to not place a lot of hope in this as kind of this end point when we can finally, life can feel like it gets back to normal. How do you think about that? And how do you advise Americans to think about that? Well, you know, there's still a lot of pieces that are not uh, resolved. I mean, the vaccine programs are uh, not a true cross-section uh, of the people. So, for example, children, uh, pregnant women, 
um, they don't show up. The aged, that is, you know, certainly over 80 uh, years, not really represented. And underrepresented minorities are underrepresented in the vaccine trials. So we have some holes in the story that will get filled in eventually. But I do think that this is something that is um, going to be a, the, the ultimate turnaround and get us past the pandemic. Um, and it's just now, you know, it's in our sight. It, it's just, it's not that far away. And we have, just have to be patient. Uh, patient. And, I, you know, I, I'm confident that we, we will get through this and we'll look back someday and be grateful that um, the vaccine programs um, led the charge. I want to talk for a couple minutes about antibody therapies. I know you've been really uh, vocal about this. President Trump called it a cure after receiving the treatment from Regeneron. Is he right about that? No, there is no cure. There's no <laughs> cure for COVID. But I have to say, putting the uh, antics uh, aside about President Trump, I do think that the monoclonal antibodies are the most exciting thing that's happened so far in the pandemic. And the reason I say that is up until now, it's been repurposing drugs, you know, like hydroxychloroquine or dexamethasone, drugs that were, have been known for, you know, years and years. And at least for dexamethasone, there was, you know, some success, but that was late in the course of a COVID illness. What's exciting about the monoclonals is all the data that supports that they could be used preventatively and early and they are now, two of the different monoclonal preparations are now under review for an emergency authorization. And the sad part about that is the claims about cure and, and the fact that Trump received this therapy are confounding the story that is clouding it because these uh, antibodies have tremendous promise. Uh, and ultimately, if we can get enough of them and make them at a very low cost, uh, we can really reduce the fatality rate of COVID-19 and maybe even also reduce the toll of long COVID. So I'm excited about this. Uh, I think what we know so far uh, strongly supports safety and the efficacy uh, looks awfully good too. Well, and last week, uh, we know Eli Lilly and Regeneron applied for emergency use for the, the for antibody treatments. Do you have any idea if and when we might expect that to be granted? And then uh, at what point can, pay, can more patients expect to be getting this treatment? Yeah, well, that's a great question, Paige. I'm hoping it won't be before November 3rd in some respects, because then it would be seen as pressure from the White House, and there's been so many examples of that throughout the pandemic, but it might be. You know, the review here is relatively straightforward. There's been two phase two trials, one of which, as you mentioned, the Lilly trial showed reduced hospitalization need uh, and also reduced medical resource need in the Regeneron trial. You know, the data look, remember EUA is may be effective. So it's just a matter of weeks before that happens. And here we are already in mid-October. I, I can't imagine it will take that long. Perhaps, you know, it's certainly sometime in November, these two antibody uh, preparations will likely uh, get a green light for emergency authorization. Now, the second part of your question is, there's not enough doses. When you think about it, we have 50,000 new infections a day confirmed. And, you know, we're talking about maybe 100,000 doses of these two different uh, antibody preps uh, available uh, imminently, and perhaps a million plus by the end of the year. That's a tiny amount. There's going to be a, some people, I've been using the term uh, a, uh, uh, a free for, instead of free for all, uh, it will be a free for all chaos because there will be people clamoring to get antibodies who are high risk. So I think we're, we're in for some trouble in that respect. It's probably a turbulent time until the supply is much better for the antibodies. I wanna talk uh, again for a minute about President, Trump, uh, President Trump's bout with COVID-19 last weekend. Um, and you know, during the time that he was in the hospital and then when he got back, there was a lot of widespread speculation on, you know, on Twitter, on social media and frustration about A, how the doctors were communicating and what they weren't sharing. And then just be a lot of kind of rampant speculation from those in the medical, including those in the medical community about what this or that treatment might mean about the state of President Trump's health. 
Um, do you feel as though it's appropriate for medical professionals to weigh in on someone like the president when they haven't themselves examined him? Uh, well, you know, I think this has been uh, a problem because of lack of clear uh, communication. So the evasiveness, uh, deceptions, uh, which have been rampant uh, from Dr. Conley uh, is just not acceptable. So we have to challenge that. The public uh, has a right to know of the president's uh, health status, especially when he comes out and makes false claims about cures and how you could have an immediate response to an antibody preparation, which is impossible. And so his doctor should be straightening that out. And you know, when you have a doctor writes a memo that the, the president tested positive for antibody when they just gave him the highest dose of an antibody preparation known to mankind, this is ludicrous, uh, Paige. So, you know, we have to uh, keep him honest and we have to show up. We just can't be, you know, uh, sitting on the sidelines being quiet and silent when there's real problems as, uh, on the communication. Well, on that note, I want to invite you to uh, weigh in more on the president's health. We know it's been over a week since the president returned from the hospital, and his doctors say he has tested negative for the virus on consecutive days. Is that sufficient evidence that it is safe at this point for the president to be around other people? Well, you know, he probably is okay to be around other people, but the problem is uh, he, it's not, they're not following um, the CDC guidelines. Uh, first of all, they didn't have reports of the conventional test would just be a PCR for the virus and tell us that that was negative. They used this Abbott uh, Binax Now test, which is not meant for this. Uh, and so they're using the, the wrong test. But more importantly, it is unquestionable to me, based on all the evidence that we have uh, and all the deception, that the president suffered from a COVID pneumonia, that is chest lung CT scan, was abnormal due to pneumonia. And he also had significant desaturation of his oxygen. Now the CDC states that that should be uh, a 20 day time, not 10 days. So, you know, basically it's, it's, uh, it's at odds with the CDC guidelines for moderate to severe, uh, that is a COVID pneumonia uh, case. And that's unfortunate because this is just not communicated properly and the wrong tests are being done. This has nothing to do with having to do an ex a physical examination uh, of the president uh, page. This is about you know knowing what the guidelines are and the fact that there's these missing pieces of data that seem to be a recurrent issue uh, throughout the entire communication um, path of the president's illness. Well, I, I know we need to wrap up soon. I know we could talk forever about these matters. I just want to ask you one, one more question. Uh, Scientific American recently endorsed uh, Joe Biden for president, and we've seen the New England Journal of Medicine call for Trump to be voted out of office. Should scientific publications uh, voice political opinions like this or remain nonpartisan? Well, yeah, and you can add to that list page uh, Science Magazine and The Lancet. And yes, I do think that we are at a, a rarefied time in our lives as far as politics having invaded science. If we had let science uh, lead the way in the pandemic for the US, we'd be in a different state right now. So the reckless, uh, the, the, the things that have happened since uh, the beginning of the US pandemic with this denial and total mismanagement leads to these uh, important uh, um, editors of journals and, and uh, magazines to call for a change and to call, to call out this as, as um, dangerously incompetent as the New England Journal uh, put it, and the lies and the anti-science. So we have to stand up for that. And it's, yes, it's unusual, it's unprecedented, but so is, uh, our, so is our time being unprecedented. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave that, leave it at that. But thank you so much, Dr. Eric Topol, for being with us today. Thank you, Paige. We have much more of our program coming up. Please stay with us, and I'll be back with Lori Garrett after this short video.
Well, welcome back. If you're just now joining us, I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, a health policy reporter here at The Washington Post. And I'd like to welcome our next guest, Dr. Uh, Lori Garrett. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist and author. Lori, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thrilled to be with you, Paige. I want to start off uh, getting your take on a letter that we saw from a trio of epidemiologists from Harvard, Oxford, and Stanford last week uh, called the Barrington Declaration. And in that letter, uh, they rebuked the heavy emphasis on lockdowns as a response to the pandemic and called for taking more focused measures to protect the more vulnerable, the elderly, while allowing younger folks to, uh, to, to have more freedom, to, to go to work, to go to school, to sort of resume normal life. And this letter generated a lot of controversy. Um, can you give us your thoughts on that approach? Well, this is just, you know, the final example of calls for essentially trying to get to herd immunity without a vaccine available, uh, without any other uh, essential interventions taken. Uh, in this case, they're calling it focus protection. So their idea is that they would uh, focus some kinds of rings of protection around the most vulnerable, you know, senior citizens, uh, stay in your cage kind of approach. Uh, but the only countries around the world that have had real success in holding their COVID numbers down to quite minimal infections and really small numbers of deaths have been individual nations that have taken very strict social distancing approaches, mandated nationally the use of masks. And then once they got their levels way down and the amount of virus circulating in the nation came to some reasonably low level, uh, then they uh, approached focused testing, focused cluster analysis, contact tracing, to find each outbreak as it might occur and stop it before it spread further. So we're talking about countries like Japan, uh, Iceland, uh, New Zealand, Finland, uh, and China, frankly. But here in the United States, we've taken a total chaos response. We have a different strategy in every single state. And in some states, we have strategies that vary county by county. We have no consistent pattern of response and no agreed upon strategic goal from one part of the country to the other, and certainly not at the federal level. And so we're not in a position to sit around waiting for herd immunity. And I would add that more and more nations around the world, especially in Europe, are finding that the major spreaders of COVID-19 are in fact the very age group that the Great Barrington Declaration thinks should be allowed to roam freely and no, no longer be under mask orders or restrictions on their behavior, namely people uh, aged between 20 and 40. I, I want to ask you about that topic of what we know about uh, how much people spread the virus at different ages, and particularly on the school issue. And as you know, we've seen many, many districts go to all virtual. Um, and But what, what we've seen, I know at the Post we've reported this, there have been fewer outbreaks, at least at K through 12 schools, than many had originally projected. And I feel like I'm hearing increasing um, frustration that we took this sort of aggressive approach to schools, uh, which, as you know, have huge effects on, on kids. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What's your own view on the approach we took to schools? Were we overly aggressive uh, or, was, or was this the right approach? Or do we even know that answer yet? Well, what is the approach that you refer to, Paige? It's different in every school district in the United States of America. There is no consistent approach to handling the shutdown or reopening of schools, to, to the policies that would be executed to protect the students and the teachers and the staff in schools and the grandma and grandpa at home that may be uh, affected when the child comes home. There is no single strategy or, or approach. And so, you know, you'd have to ask me about a specific school district and a specific plan. And unfortunately, many of the guidances that we were expecting from the CDC that would tell us, you know, how well or not well various strategies were working have been squelched. 
But um, right. And so I want to I want to ask you a little more about that, because like so, as you mentioned, we don't have a huge uh, over, you know, overarching federal strategy. But there's also the argument that this is a local thing, right? We have different rates of transmission in different areas. Um, you know, we have states that are doing better than other states. The virus moves in different waves around different parts of the country. So how much should the approach be localized versus federalized? Well, unfortunately, Paige, in the United States, we have little choice in answering this because unlike all of our counterpart countries around the world, and certainly every single one of the countries that has successfully brought COVID under control, uh, we have a uh, bottom up approach to public health, whereas those successful countries all have top down public health systems. What I mean by this is that if you are in say New Zealand today, where it's a virtually COVID free nation, they have a national health system and they have national health policy. And so whatever is decided in the capital uh, is executed nationwide in a uniform strategy. Uh, this allows each part of the country to be able to see and anticipate what's coming from another part of the country and what they are supposed to do to anticipate it and deal with it. Um, here in the United States, our public health apparatus is localized. It grew historically from the county level, even the town level. And in many states in the United States, there's no consistent public health law and regulation from one county to the next. And there's certainly no consistent policy from one nation, uh, state to the next. Um, historically, when we've had epidemics and outbreaks, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has sort of overcome this uh, jurisdictional and legal set of boundaries uh, that hold public health response down at the local level by issuing very strong daily uh, press briefings and uh, guidelines to the states, helping the states to know this is working, that's working, this is failing, that's failing, uh, so that we had a fairly uniform response nationwide. None of that has been undertaken by the CDC in this outbreak. We're dealing with an epidemic running blind. There have been almost no press conferences of any kind from the Centers for Disease Control, which is staggering. Paige, you've been on this beat, you know. In past outbreaks, we often had two or three press conferences daily out of Atlanta from CDC headquarters. We had uh, uh, the National Operations Center located inside CDC headquarters, uh, talking, taking phone calls from every single state, the governors, major Fortune 500 corporations, and guiding them with responses what should they do? How should they do it? So that the nation was really coordinated in a single epidemic response. We do not have that today. We have none of that. Zero of what I just described is going on today. I know that you've taken a lot of time looking at other countries and how they've responded to the pandemic. And I'd love to hear which countries you think have done the best job uh, versus not as good of a job in controlling the virus. And I'd also like you, uh, if you would, to comment on Sweden because its response has become the topic of much controversy and debate. We know it stayed away from the lockdowns early on and had a very high death rate. And yet now it looks like it's having the one of the lowest rates of, of new cases in Europe. So what do you think about Sweden specifically, and then other countries overall? Yeah, there are many countries that we should look to uh, that have had tremendous success and that we can hold up as examples to the world. And they are not all rich countries. I mean, let's start with the whole continent of Africa, startlingly low levels of uh, COVID-19 across the entire continent. Uh, South Africa had a scare. Uh, but they seem to have brought it really, truly under control. Uh, and I think, you know, six months ago, everybody would have said, hands down, the worst epidemics will all be in Africa because of their resource scarcities and their paucity of healthcare facilities. But that's not been the case. And we can talk about why. Uh, and then let me just jump to a few other countries, circle back to whatever interests you. Um, I mentioned Japan earlier. Uh, Japan had a very aggressive response, they went on lockdown for six weeks uh, and came out of it with just cluster responses here and there. They have a uh, prevalence of uh, 
of COVID-19, actually it's an incidence, of a 1.2 per 100,000 population. Whereas, uh, compare that to us, we're at 66 per 100,000. So we are, you know, far, far worse than Japan. Uh, you can take a country like Vietnam, not a booming economy, not a huge, a prosperous nation, and yet they've had almost no COVID crisis at all. Ditto Laos, Cambodia, Singapore, Thailand. Uh, and what's in common about much of these Asian countries that I'm naming, South Korea would be one that struggled and then brought things under control, is that they had prior experience with either SARS or MERS, the other two big coronaviruses. And they learned a lot from that. They instituted policies that were based from the very beginning of this COVID crisis on their learning experiences with SARS or in the case of South Korea with MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. Uh, in Europe, the best examples of real success are Iceland, uh, Finland, which has had a far better response uh, to the COVID crisis than Sweden, uh, ranks number one among the Nordic nations. Uh, and um, we might also consider looking carefully at Germany, um, which is now, but had good results before now. Um, in Latin America, we see some real crisis, and it's hard to name a, a real success story in Latin America. Certainly not. Do you do you somebody? Do you predict yeah. more global pandemics of this nature? I'm sorry, there's some technical hearing somebody back on, uh, on on the line, and I don't hear you. Well, I will continue, and hopefully, somebody at your end will correct this technical issue. Uh, but um, I, I'm so sorry, we're, we're having trouble with the audio. Um, let me ask that again. Do you predict more global pandemics of this nature? I said, I think I'm hearing Eric Topol very loud. Hard for me. I'm, I'm sorry, I think our folks are working but, on that right now. Well, yeah, so, but to continue, uh, you had asked about Sweden. So let me jump to uh, Sweden. Of course, Sweden has been the big controversy of the COVID crisis from the point of view of folks looking for strategies to control the epidemic without hurting their economies. And certainly Wall Street has had a great affection for the Swedish example because it held out the possibility that, yes, you're going to lose a lot of your old folks, people my age and older. Oh, well, that's a sacrifice you have to make because you want the economy to keep booming. Um, and that seemed to be the promise of the Swedish example, which was to take almost no uh, limitations on uh, human behavior and movement, no mandatory mask wearing, leave it to the good judgment of the citizenry to take appropriate precautions. Um, so Sweden ranks the highest in the Nordic nations for death toll, both on a per capita and absolute basis. Uh, it ranks in the top 10 for death toll on a per capita basis worldwide. Um, it lost a very significant number of institutionalized senior citizens who were in um, various kinds of uh, uh, senior or assisted living centers across Sweden. Um, and it hasn't seen the huge economic boom that was expected from taking that stance. While its economy um, GDP growth appears to look better perhaps than some of its Nordic neighbors, it's not appreciably so. Well, thank you for that that really interesting response. I know that um, you know we were paying a lot of attention to how things were going in other countries, and then of course our response has been so challenging um, that a lot of the focus has been on the U.S. Uh, and I do apologize for the technical difficulties earlier. Um, Paige, I think everything is Paige, paged out. I may I, I made a mistake, Paige, by not mentioning the most glaring example. And what would that be? The nation that shares the longest border with the United States, Canada, in every single aspect, every single statistical measure of performance in a pandemic, Canada has done 
far better than the United States. And in some cases, it's glaring. It's like we're on different planets. They share this massive border with us. Um, and yet they've had a very low death rate compared to the United States, a low COVID infection rate, a low daily incidence. In every single statistical measure, Canada has outperformed the United States. I know that you uh, have previously praised uh, the handling by George W. Bush uh, of fighting AIDS in Africa and how he approached that. On the other hand, you've been extremely critical of President Trump's handling of this pandemic. Why do you think the U.S. was so unprepared for this crisis? Did you see that coming? And do you think there's anything the Trump administration has done right in response? Uh, well, first of all, many of us have been warning for decades that a pandemic, a serious uh, novel organism pandemic was coming and that we were ill prepared. We underestimated our vulnerabilities. There was a huge amount of hubris in American culture, assuming that we could conquer any microbe that came along. Just like that, we'll have a vaccine. Just like that, we'll have a cure. No problem, we're Americans. And so no president, no president in my lifetime has made an appropriate level of financial commitment. No Congress has allocated resources adequately to allow the nation to really prepare itself. But to be fair, uh, because our system, again, is based on a kind of grassroots public health, that starts at the bottom and works its way up. A lot of this funding paradigm depends on what the city councils uh, supported, what local county governments are willing to pay for and states are willing to pay for. And so we've always had a patchwork of ill-prepared areas across the country where uh, governments are loath to put resources into public health on an ongoing and consistent basis. So you can compare states and see you know, which states have the greatest vulnerabilities, which states have the fewest number of physicians on the payroll, of uh, epidemiologists on the payroll. Uh, there are counties in the United States where there is no physician and no epidemiologist on the public health payroll at all. And that means that they're loath to be capable of responding to an outbreak on their own. They're going to definitely need federal assistance and guidance. They simply don't have the expertise. Um, when HIV AIDS came along, every single response across the board in the United States and in mo almost every other country in the world was wrong. We really kind of carried out a textbook example with the arrival of HIV AIDS in the 1980s of how to do it all completely incorrectly. And the primary mistake made in one country after another was to respond not against the virus, but against the people who were at high, ri highest risk of acquiring the virus. And so here in the United States, it was anti-homosexual responses, you know, pass laws limiting gay activities, gay individuals, target the gay community and blame them for the virus. In some countries, it was uh, female prostitutes or commercial sex workers who were targeted uh, or IV drug users. Whatever the case, instead of attacking the virus, we attacked the people. And where are we today? We have nearly 40 million people infected with HIV across the world, about a little over half of whom are in some form of treatment that's allowing them to lead their lives and raise their children. But this is abominable. And the big take home lesson from the HIV experience that I apply to COVID today is that we really have two choices to make. We can either as a global community learn from the HIV experience and say, uh-oh, we can't allow that to happen. We can't add uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus to the landscape of permanently dangerous to human beings disease of a new virus that appeared and it was allowed to become a feature of the human health landscape going forward. And in, we're dealing with it, costs billions of dollars every year of wealth transferred from the wealthy world to the poor world to pay for treatment and keeping people alive. Now, if we scale that up to the scale of what COVID is becoming and imagine 
you know, uh, whether it's the Regeneron monoclonal antibody therapy that uh, President Trump took or some other form of drug treatment, that we would somehow have a massive operation underway where uh, several hundred billion people around, I mean, million people around the world, uh, billions actually, would require uh, subsidized treatment uh, from U.S. taxpayers and the taxpayers of other wealthy nations in order to keep them alive, or we would simply say they're disposable, no one's going to help them, and they will die. Uh, that's appalling. We're in a situation now where rather than it being stigma against the individuals who are infected that's been our major uh, political uh, error made, if you will, uh, we're dealing with red state, blue state response to masks and social distancing. So if you're a Republican, you're allegedly anti-mask, anti-social distancing. And if you're a Democrat, you're allegedly pro-mask and pro-social distancing. This is idiotic, Paige. This has nothing to do with science, nothing to do with um, public health. It's just pure politics in its ugliest form played out in the United States of America. And the big winner in this political chaos is the virus. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you for this lively conversation. Lori Garrett, thanks so much for being with us today. Total delight, Paige. Thank you. If you'd like to watch highlights from today's program, just head over to WashingtonPostLive.com. And please come back and join us right here tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., where my colleague Francis Stead Sellers will interview some emerging young leaders about their work combating climate change in their communities. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, and thanks so much for watching.